Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our next IGLUNA project show. IGLUNA is an international student platform coordinated by Space Innovation and bringing together the student teams from all over the world to develop the technologies relevant for the future of space exploration. We are streaming today live from Pilatus in Lucerne, Switzerland, and our guest today is the team PO9 Lunar Zebra from TU Delft. They are developing a um, uh, swarm of rovers, miniaturized and autonomous, to discover the lunar surface. They have prepared a video for you, and after the video, we will have a live Q&A session. So don't forget to submit your questions in our YouTube chat, and let's watch the video. Meet Lunar Zebra, a joint faculty project at the Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. We are a part of the Zebra group that aims to push the boundaries of autonomous swarm robots. Zebra stands for Zes Benige Robot, which means six-legged robot in Dutch. These six C-shaped legs are what make our rover stand out from other interplanetary rovers that we're used to seeing. This technology was brought over to TU Delft from the REX project in 2013, and the Zebra group has been investigating and implementing this tech on rovers of all sizes for various Earth applications ever since. The Lunar Zebra branch of the project started back in 2017 with the aim of educating the next generation of space engineers and gearing them up for joining the space industry, achieving this through the hands-on experience of working on actual space missions. The main objective of Lunar Zebra is to foster knowledge of the usage of robotics in space and to address a fundamental question. Can multiple smaller, cheaper, and simpler rovers be used as a more reliable and robust alternative to the single large, complex, and expensive rover model that we're used to seeing in space exploration. This leads us to the goal of sending the world's smallest and lightest rover built by students to the moon. This first moon mission, which will be a technology demonstration of our rover system, will be with a single rover. However, we envision to have an entire swarm of zebras carrying out missions on the lunar surface one day. This is where Iguna 2021 comes in. This field campaign is Lunar Zebra's first large-scale step towards swarming. Together with a team of about 25 students, ranging from first-year students up to postdoctoral researchers, we have developed Zebra's for the Iguna campaign, and for the first time also docking stations for these rovers. Let's first introduce our Iguna Lunar Zebra team to you. Our team has three main branches that are led and tied together by the project management. The first branch is the technical one, who have worked on the rover and the docking station systems. Next is the ground segment that have developed and executed the ground control during the mission. And finally, the systems engineers that keep the different aspects of the mission and all the systems coordinated. Some robots can be used for a wide variety of applications on Earth, on the Moon, and even on other planets. Some lunar examples include using a robotic swarm to perform remote exploration and mapping of locations on the surface, but also of more dangerous environments where we had rather not send the humans. You can think of subsurface locations like caves or lava tubes on the moon that might be interesting options for shelter or extreme terrain like the permanent shadow in the lunar craters. Another use of the swarms on the moon is for the deployment of the network of sensors. Rather than setting up each measurement device one by one, the rovers carrying the payloads can take each one to its designated location in parallel. This can be useful for science experiments like looking for water or other resources on the moon, but also to set up a communication network for example. The same principle can be used on Earth. Some examples include sensors for measuring toxins and pollutants in remote areas or detecting illegal substances at an airport. Swarms on Earth can also be deployed for search and rescue missions in locations that are difficult to access or too dangerous for humans. What ways can you think of using some robots? Zebras have been on previous field tests and analog missions prior to Igluna, each contributing incremental knowledge and results about our rover systems. Our field tests at ESA STEX Mars Yard allowed for observing the performance of the locomotion in sandy and rocky terrain, slightly similar to what it will experience on the moon. Another field day was at Dikos in Nordbeck which sits in a grainy terrain filled with obstacles and even craters. The test conducted here enabled us to gather visual data for the obstacle detection algorithm and further test the locomotion system. At the past MS-3 mission in Hawaii and at the upcoming Chill Ice mission in Iceland, zebras accompany the analog astronauts on their mission. 
In Hawaii, the rover was tested in an extremely rocky terrain, cooperating with other rovers that were there. The zebra was controlled both by the analog astronaut and even by our own ground control back in Delft. In Iceland, we'll focus on and further investigate the interaction between humans and zebras during a mission. The Igluna 2021 field campaign is a fundamental and substantial step towards accomplishing our ultimate goals. Our main objective at Igluna is to test the overall system's capability of carrying out defined exploration tasks in an unfamiliar environment and doing this in a long-term, continuous, and autonomous manner. To achieve this, rovers similar in size and subsystem architecture to the Lunar Zebra were designed and built. This allows for representative testing for the Lunar Rover, while still keeping an emphasis on the mass manufacturability and cost effectiveness needed for this campaign here on Earth. This will help to further improve and raise the technology readiness levels of our key technologies, such as the onboard software, obstacle avoidance, and autonomous navigation. Another valuable aspect of Igluna is the opportunity to deploy the rovers on Mount Pilatus, while having the ground control at a remote location, both at the Verkeers house in Lucerne and back at our ground station in Delft. Treating the operational plan for the field campaign as an actual mission has provided the team with both mission planning and execution experience, which is beneficial for our future moon mission operations. The mission on Mount Pilatus is planned in operational cycles, in which the group of rovers have to locate three randomly placed targets within the testbed of 20 by 20 meters, without any prior knowledge of the area. The cycle starts with the deployment of the rovers from the docking stations, and they will start randomly searching for the targets that are identifiable by unique QR codes. Once a rover has found and correctly identified a target, it informs the docking station, which in turn informs the rest of the rovers. While the rovers are on the hunt for targets, they are detecting and avoiding obstacles as needed, using their onboard sensors and cameras. Once all the targets have been found, the rovers return to the docking stations and the cycle is complete. The operational cycle is designed to be executed without any human interaction needed. When a rover's battery is depleted before the cycle is over, it returns to the docking station where it can dock and charge wirelessly. If the weather conditions are unfavorable, such as experiencing high wind speeds, the rovers can also seek shelter in the stations. Lastly, the docking stations provide the data relay between the ground control and the rovers. Even though the rovers are performing the mission autonomously, diagnostic data is sent back to the ground control to monitor their status and if necessary, they can intervene and take control of the rovers as needed. This is done through what is called the mission communication layer, which has a low data rate and an artificial delay, replicating the communication conditions on the moon. There is also a surveillance layer, which has a high da higher data rate, allowing us to gather even more data from the rovers, which can be used later. The architecture of the ground segment consists of a front end and a back end. The front end is the interface used by the operator to monitor the data and send commands to the testbed. This can be accessed online, allowing a controller to be anywhere in the world. In this case, at the control room at the Fikers House in Lucerne, but also at our head headquarters in Delft. The back end software is what makes this possible, running onto your Delft server. This software allows the users to access the command and data interface through an internet connection, while also automatically logging and passing all the data which streamlines this process greatly. Zooming in to the rover design is based on that of the Lunar Zebra, but modified to suit the needs of a testbed on a mountain rather than the actual moon. This includes, for example, a waterproof design. The rovers are approximately the same size with a footprint of an A4 sheet of paper and standing at a height of about 15 cm. Both the chassis and the legs are 3D printed from PLA. For the locomotion, there are six C-shaped legs, which is char characteristic for a zebra. These are synchronized with the locomotion algorithm to perform different gates, such as walking forward, backward, or turning in place. Each leg is driven by its own driver, though, to reduce the risk in the event of one malfunctioning. The main benefit from having legs instead of wheels is the robustness in overcoming obstacles. The rover can traverse many different types of terrain and does not easily get stuck or manages to get unstuck through its repeated steps. Zebras can even walk over obstacles up to almost the same height as the legs themselves. 
For obstacles that are too big for the rover to conquer, that's where the obstacle detection and avoidance algorithms come in. A LiDAR is used to detect obstacles, distinguishing hard from soft objects and detecting the distance to and direction of the object. This prevents hazardous obstacles from reaching within 40 cm of the rover, and the rover's path can be changed to avoid it. An ultrasonic sensor was also included for cliff detection, though due to a change in testbed location, high cliffs are no longer a risk to the mission. An inertial measurement unit, IMU, is used to detect angles that are too steep for the rover to climb. Lastly, a Raspberry Pi camera is used for the detection of more complex obstacles, as well as reading QR codes on the targets. Color detection is also used for the identification of a flag nearby the docking stations, as well as a magnetometer, which detects a magnetic field used to correctly guide the rovers into the stations. The rover is powered by four lithium-ion battery cells, which are controlled by the battery management system. The batteries are recharged through a wireless energy receiver, which is a coil present under his belly, while the transmitting coil is present in the docking station. In addition to these, the power distribution, power monitoring and power protection system complete the electrical power system, or EPS, of the rover. The command and data handling subsystem, CDHS, is the main brain of the rover and relies on ROS, the robot operating system, running on a Raspberry Pi. CDHS handles the communication between the different subsystems on board, as well as the communication with the docking stations. It is also the main decision-making authority on the rover, allowing the systems to function as one whole. The docking stations are a brand new concept for Luna Zebra uh, team, having been designed and implemented for the first time for this uh, Iduna field campaign. It serves several purposes for, to the mission. First of all, it is a charging station for the rovers to return to when their battery is depleted. The rover can climb up the ramp, which is present to uh, prevent flooding and uh, aid the alignment of the rover. A water sensor is incorporated to communicate if the water level would rise too high and put the charging process at risk. The zebra can sit down inside the canopy uh, to align with the transmitting coil and charge wirelessly. The canopy itself is to protect the rover from precipitation as well as the docking station's own electronics, which are kept in cases attached to the inner top uh, side of the rover. The canopy itself was designed using topological optimization, which is a computational design method that uses stress calculations to optimize the material distribution for given load cases. This allows us to minimize the material needed to get the job done, while also reducing the manufacturing time needed to produce it. The result is an organic looking skeleton, this main structure, with thinner skins to fill in the gaps, uh, to fully seal off the docking station and achieve waterproofing. For the actual manufacturing, um, the docking station uh, cover is divided into 20 individual pieces, allowing each to be 3D printed with our own printers, using PLA as material. This also provides for ease of transportation by keeping the pieces separate and then performing assembly on site. As mentioned, the docking station is also equipped with its own electronics. These also serve uh, several purposes. Of course, there are electronics uh, present to charge the rovers, but also to control and monitor the charging process. Uh, one of the docking stations serves as the main controller for the rest of the stations, as well as hosting the electronics that allow for appropriate docking. This main station also houses a weather station, monitoring the climate of the testbed, checking parameters such as temperature, air pressure, humidity, and wind speed. Uh, this way, it can uh, call the rovers to seek shelter within the stations where there are, uh, when there are unfavorable weather conditions. Lastly, the docking station relays the data between the rovers and the ground control. After designing, simulating, and planning, and waiting for all the components and parts to start arriving, the time finally came to manufacture and assemble the systems, which we have for the largest part done ourselves. Most of the structural elements, like the rover bodies and legs, but also the pieces for the docking station canopies, have been 3D printed with PLA. The docking station ramps have been made out of wood, as the materials were readily available to us and relatively low in price. Electronic PCBs like the motor drivers and the electrical power system, but also the docking station electronics were soldered in-house. Other electronics like the main computer on board, the Raspberry Pi, along with the sensors like the Raspberry Pi camera, the lighter and the ultrasonic sensors were readily integratable to the rest of the system. And don't forget the software, which brings life to all the components. 
Hours of coding and then many hours of debugging were done, and the integration and testing were performed as the hardware became available. Igluna has been an incredible experience for the Lunar Zebra team, being supported by Space Innovation and its partners along the entire way. From starting the project and conceptualizing our goals and how we would achieve them, to actually designing and building our systems and being able to bring them to Luzerne, all within a year and during a global pandemic. It's needless to say, our team faced quite some challenges and uncertainties along the way. Simply working remotely for the larger part of the project in a new team with many different backgrounds, both academically as well as culturally, has shown us that clear communication is very important. Other challenges were more unexpected and out of our hands, such as shortages of components or delayed or lost deliveries, sometimes even requiring designs to be changed to include components that were actually available instead. It has definitely been a continuous learning experience forcing us to come up with creative solutions and workarounds. It has all been experience that will be poured back into our future work on Lunar Zebra, but also in each of our future careers. Welcome back to Pilatus. I hope that you enjoyed the video and I see that we already have some questions in our YouTube chat. And the first question is, what was your greatest challenge during this project? Thank you for the question. Um, I think our greatest challenge in this project was definitely um, getting through everything and bringing it all together to be one final system. I think integration has definitely been a challenge for us. Um, the individual testing did go quite well, but once we brought it together, there were a few unforeseen issues. And um, yeah, non-technical, there were also quite a few logistical problems and challenges that we faced this year. Um, but that allowed us to get creative and exercise our problem solving capabilities. Thank you very much. Um, somebody is asking, Apollo astronauts had trouble evaluating distances and sizes on the moon. How does Lunar Zebra tackle this problem? I can answer that one as well. Um, so this is our Igluna Zebra, but as you saw in the video, we also have a Lunar Zebra that's meant to go to the moon, and that one actually has a stereo camera on board. Um, it's actually two of the same cameras that we've developed ourselves, and what this stereo camera allows us to do is um, yeah, see images from two different angles, and that way we can calculate the distance to objects. Thank you very much. And I guess as a follow up uh, on this discussion, what kind of missions on the moon do you foresee for Lunar Zebra? And maybe the second one as well, how can Lunar Zebra assist astronauts in the lunar missions? Uh, I'll take the first one. Um, so possible missions for Lunar Zebra on the moon would first of all be just the exploration of the lunar surface, obviously, but also uh, the exploration of caves, for example, in a swarm would be another application. And a third one, which is quite theoretical as of now, but also possible, would be the creation of a LUFA experiment on the backside of the moon, which is basically a big antenna on the backside of the moon to measure the, um, the background radiation in the universe. And maybe Emma? Um, so basically, uh, our rovers uh, work in a swarm, uh, in a swarm together, uh, and they are capable of reaching places that would otherwise might be dangerous for astronauts. Uh, the Lunar Zebra has not been designed to uh, work in collaboration with an astronaut, so they would be sent to the moon by themselves. They would be working as an uh, autonomous swarm, um, and um, because they are so small, they um, um, they could be used uh, to reach uh, different places such as uh, Lunar Cave um, and um, because they work in a swarm so we have several of them um, it would be quite um, like possible that we would dispose of one if, if one gets lost so the other ones would continue the mission um, but basically yeah they, they are able to reach places that would be quite dangerous for a human and uh, because we can mass produce them they uh, we can uh, dispose of one in case uh, of danger. Thank you very much. And I see that uh, you brought uh, one lunar zebra with you. And I have a question. So how light is the rover? Um, so the rover actually weighs about 2.5 kilograms, which is similar to the lunar rover as well. Um, other than that, it's actually 10 times la sorry, smaller and lighter than any other successful lunar mission. 
Um, so yeah, hopefully this one will also be the lightest lunar mission, hopefully. Thank you very much. As a follow-up on the lunar mission, uh, what kind of scientific use uh, would Lunar Zebra o project offer? So our first uh, lunar mission um, is a technology demonstration, mainly of the system that we've developed and all the subsystems included on it. But we also see Lunar Zebra as a platform for different scientific experiments. And um, the first one that we'll be flying is actually a radiation sensor that will measure the radiation levels on the surface of the moon, which hasn't often been done before. Thank you very much. Uh, so we discussed a lot about moon missions, but can you also think about terrestrial applications for your project? Yes. Um, so, um, yeah, the rover doesn't uh, have uh, problems um, exploring um, different uh, territories, uh, and we could use it to the explore territories that would be otherwise dangerous for uh, humans, uh, such as um, territories where uh, um, there are poisonous uh, substances uh, or uh, drugs that could be used, for instance, in an, um, in an airport. Um, so any territory that would be dangerous for exploration for the human uh, and in any case uh, where there would be um, a flood or uh, another event that would be dangerous for humans, that rover could go there and uh, perform rescue missions. Thank you very much. Um, one of the questions is also, is the Lunar Zebra rover designed to survive the lunar night? So um, the first Lunar Zebra that we'll be sending only has a passive temperature control and the lunar night at the South Pole can go down all the way to minus 230 degrees. So we won't be having an active temperature control to be able withstand that um, but if by any miracle it does uh, survive the lunar night and like be able to heat back up again once the sun comes out then we will have it programmed to be able to carry on with its operations again thank you very much um, I have some questions about the the docking stations uh, would the docking station be needed also on the moon and how would the lunar design be different from the one on earth Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. You okay. So for the stage, we specifically designed them for uh, the Iguana mission because uh, on the rover, the uh, low rover has also a so solar panel, so they don't need a docking station uh, to charge. And um, like the conditions which are here, like there's not a lot of sun, so we needed some way to charge the rovers, and that's why we uh, developed the docking stations because there wouldn't be no enough solar radiation to charge them. Maybe another one to follow up on the discussion between the lunar mission and your mission on, on Pilatus. Uh, what are the dangers of lunar dust uh, on the moon and uh, what are the dangers of dirt and water here on Mount Pilatus? So um, for dirt and water, of course, water is not good for our electronics. Uh, if it gets into the rover where all the electronics are, then um, short circuits could happen and then it definitely won't work anymore. Um, and then the same kind of goes for dirt. It could clog the motors and also then hamper their movement. And um, lunar dust kind of acts in the same way if it would get into the motors. Um, yeah, that definitely wouldn't be good. And on top of that, it's very fine and abrasive. Um, and if that isn't enough, it's also electrostatically charged, so it's very sticky and um, it could be harmful for the electronics as well. Um, I have a question about uh, the design of the rover. Why do you decide to have the rover with six legs and not more or, or less? <laughs> I can take that. Sure. Uh, yes, yeah, so this is actually part of the Lunar Zebra um, heritage in a way, the six uh, legs uh, C-shaped design has been uh, taken uh, over, so it's not our own design. Um, but uh, basically the logic is um, somehow inspired, or like partly inspired by um, uh, how insect locomotion. Uh, the idea with the six uh, legs is that at any point uh, the rover is able to be stable on three points, so three legs will be on the ground uh, and then it will switch to the other three. Uh, so that provides stability. Uh, why not uh, more of them, well, because this could uh, represent problems for the mechanical problems for the locomotion system. Thank you very much for the nice explanation. Um, somebody is asking up to how many rovers can connect, interact simultaneously. Is there a need to increase the number? 
Um, so right now, uh, as explained in our video, Igluna is our first step towards actually testing uh, rovers in a swarm together. And in this year, we really focused on building the hardware um, that would be capable of functioning in such a swarm. But haven't uh, exactly worked on the swarming algorithms themselves so that would actually be the next step for us in um, yeah with these Igluna rovers to work on that. So speaking of Igluna project um, where did it start and did you already have a working rover before you started working on the Igluna project? Um, so as Emma already explained we do have some heritage from the RHEX from from the US uh, the locomotion in a way with the six legs um, however basically for Igluna we designed a new rover from scratch starting last year uh, we only used very few heritage heritage things from from our other rovers especially from the moon rover we hardly took over anything but yeah here we are with a new rover one year later Great. Um, would you also choose a 3D printed design for the lunar applications as well? Uh, well, it depends uh, how uh, solid that 3D printing would actually make the rover for the moon. Uh, basically, the choice for 3D printing uh, for Igluna was uh, based on um, yeah, actually ease of manufacturing. Um, so with 3D printing, we can easily um, prototype manufacture the rover uh, and we can also uh, test uh, several iterations of it, which we have done. Um, I think f surely for the moon, we would need to, if 3D printing would be necessary or it would be the, the choice, um, we would not do it in PLA. PLA is a uh, material that we have used for our station, uh, for our uh, rovers and for the docking stations. And it, uh, it is a light material and we could also choose uh, the uh, amount of infill that we would uh, have for it and that, that makes uh, the material uh, even lighter. But for the moon, uh, we would need to, to uh, choose for moon-proof materials. Even if uh, 3D printing would be used, maybe that would be with uh, metal sintering. <laughs> Thank you very much for the answer. Um, so discussing a bit about the rovers again, how does the rover walk back to the docking station on its own? Okay, so for that problem, um, we uh, made like the initial su assumptions that we needed like a system which uh, would function without a, a camera and also would function both in daylight, uh, both during day and nighttime and also in all weather conditions. So um, that's why we choose like for a magnetic system. So there are like wires uh, on the ground which carry like a magnetic current. And then uh, on around these lines, a field will arise, like a magnetic field, and the rovers can follow the field. So basically the rovers can get like a factor which points to the entrance of uh, one specific docking station and uh, the rover can simply follow that. And then the docking station itself, when the rover sends a charging request, the docking station uh, determines which dock is empty and then the wire going to that specific dock is activated. Um, so basically, uh, the rover um, makes a request and then the docking station activates one wire and the rover can follow that specific wire. Thank you very much. I have an interesting question um, from the chat. If the rover overturns, would it be still able to move? Overturn, do you mean flip? Yeah. Yes, uh, so the original idea, of course, was that um, it's asymmet asymmetrical on both sides. This will allow it to be able to flip over and still walk because of the C-shaped legs. However, now because of the LiDAR, it becomes a bit more difficult and difficult to say what it would actually do. But theoretically, it does have the strength to be able to flip itself over since it will be not fully flipped, but resting on the LiDAR. This is really interesting. Thank you very much. Um, let me see. What is the point of topological optimization in the docking station design when the parts are disconnected from each other? Okay, I can take that. <laughs> um, so topological optimization, just very shortly, is a, a computational, or it was a technique uh, achieved by computational design uh, through which material is disposed only where necessary. Um, and this means that, uh, well, on the one side, we could use uh, less material uh, and that means also faster uh, manufacturing uh, process. Um, we did, um, the, the initial idea was to, um, well, like how the docking station was designed was based on uh, the idea that we would manufacture it in one piece, uh, but for ease of transportation and also for preventing uh, any risks of breaking, we have decided to uh, divide it in panels. Uh, the panels are orthogonal now, so they are somehow um, going against the uh, topological optimization, but they could also be printed transversal. Uh, 
to it. Um, and we have actually tested, so there were some uh, kids on the test bed that have sat on it. Uh, it's um, weight proof and also for the reasons that we, for the purpose that we need now, uh, it does not need to hold uh, so much weight. Um, and it also gives a quite interesting aesthetic, I think. Thank you very much to all of you for the uh, interesting discussion. Um, as a last question, so did you achieve everything you wanted in the Gluna project and what are your next steps? Who would like to? Um, like I said before, the integration part of it um, was challenging for us during this mission and um, we also ran into some failures along the way and we didn't want to yeah, further damage the systems before being back at our own lab and having all of our equipment to really get to the bottom of the causes of the failures but that is definitely something that we want to get to do as soon as we're back in Delft and then we'll probably carry out the mission that we planned um, back there. Thank you very much. Um, so I think there are no more further questions in, in our chat. Uh, thank you very much for the interesting discussion. It was uh, great to see you here in Lucerne. <laughs> um, thank you to our vi uh, viewers uh, for following us uh, during the live stream and thank you for your questions. Um, I we hope that you enjoyed the show and don't uh, miss our next Igluna project shows as well. Have a nice day and goodbye.